two essential components of our perception of music are meter and grouping. Meter is a framework of levels of beats, points in time that we feel as accented. Beats are often represented in a so-called metrical grid. In 4-4 time, we have levels of beats corresponding to eighth notes, quarter notes, half notes, and whole notes. Beats that are present at higher levels are stronger than beats at low levels. There may also be levels above the measure, so-called hypermetrical levels. Often, for example, odd-numbered downbeats seem to be stronger than even-numbered downbeats, creating a two-measure level of hypermeter. These metrically strong downbeats are called hyperdownbeats. We may also feel that the first measure in each group of four is stronger than the third measure, creating a four-measure level of hypermeter. In this presentation, we'll mainly be concerned with hypermetrical levels of meter, focusing especially on the two-measure level. Grouping is a framework of segments or groups, representing subphrases, phrases, and groups of phrases. In an eight-measure phrase, measures often group together in pairs, and these pairs group together to form four-measure phrases. These four-measure phrases group together to form the complete eight-measure phrase. Eight-measure phrases may group into larger sections, and we may also feel that there are smaller one-measure groups. Here we'll be focusing on intermediate levels of grouping. The combination of meter and grouping, along with harmony, is what theorist William Rothstein calls phrase rhythm. In this video, we'll look at ways that phrase rhythm is used in music and how it is used to construct interesting and satisfying melodies. We'll look at examples from both classical music and modern popular music and we'll see that there are some striking similarities in the ways that classical composers and modern pop musicians use phrase rhythm. We'll begin by discussing regular structures, those that involve a repeated pattern. Then we'll talk about irregular structures that can be derived from regular ones using phrase expansion and overlap. And finally, we'll talk about structures that are just inherently irregular. The most common approach to phrase rhythm by far is the one shown in my first example. Here we have an eight measure phrase divided into two four measure phrases, which further divide into two measure subphrases. Each group begins at the beginning of a measure or sometimes just before. There is a two measure level of hypermeter with odd numbered measures stronger than even numbered ones. Thus, the strongest beat within each two measure group is at or near the beginning of the group. We call this a beginning strong pattern. Because this particular configuration is so common, I'll call it standard phrase structure. Standard phrase structure has been common for over 200 years across a wide variety of musical styles. Here's an example from a Mozart opera aria from the 1780s. Here's an example from an Ella Fitzgerald song from 1938. And here's one more very recent example. We're a thousand miles from comfort. We have traveled land and sea. But as long as you are with me, there's no place I'd rather be. While these three eight measure phrases are all similar in terms of phrase rhythm, they differ in important ways as well. One difference lies in the way they use patterns of rhythmic repetition. In the Mozart, the first three two-measure groups all use the same rhythm, while the fourth one ends a bit differently, forming an A-A-A-B pattern. In the Fitzgerald, while each group has slightly different syncopations, it's the first, second, and fourth groups that are most similar, with the third being contrasting. And in the Clean Bandit song, the first and third differ from the second and fourth. If one considered pitch patterns as well, this might lead to a different labeling. 
but this very important issue of pattern repetition will not be our concern here. By the way, I'll follow custom in identifying classical pieces by their composers and pop songs by their performing artists. Full information about classical performers and pop songwriters will be provided at the end of the presentation. A common variant of standard phrase structure is what's called a sentence structure. This structure is identical to the standard structure, except that the second four-measure phrase does not divide into two, it's just a single undivided four-measure phrase. This creates what we could call a 2 plus 2 plus 4 structure. Here's an example of sentence structure from a Beethoven piano sonata. The sentence is common in pop music too, though the second four measure phrase is usually shortened. Here's an example from The Who. We'll be in the streets, with our children at our feet. In the morals that they worship, we'll be gone. Going back to standard phrase rhythm, I mentioned earlier that we can also consider a four-measure level of hypermeter in which measures one and five are strong. In some cases, the groups are shifted relative to the meter so that each group has quite a long upbeat or anacrusis. But we can still consider this a beginning strong pattern because within each four-measure group, the strongest beat is near the beginning. Here's an example from Nat King Cole. Miss the Saturday dance Heard they crowded the floor Couldn't bear it without you Don't get around much anymore Let's suppose now that the groups in standard phrase structure are shifted slightly to the right. Now we have quite a different situation. The strongest beat within each two measure and four measure group is now at the end of the group rather than at the beginning. And the final two and four measure groups now overlap into the ninth measure. We call this end strong phrasing. End strong patterns have always been much less common than beginning strong ones, but they do sometimes occur. Here is an end strong theme from a Mendelssohn string quartet. And here is an end strong melody from the 1990s rock group Nirvana. While the final syllable of each group may seem to fall just before the bar line, it is understood to belong on the following downbeat. This is what we call anticipatory syncopation. End strong patterns have quite a different feeling from beginning strong patterns. Each group feels like it's moving toward its strong point rather than moving away from it. A final possibility is what I call island phrasing. This is when groups begin just after an empty downbeat and end just before one, so that they seem to avoid strong metrical accents. Island phrasing is rare in classical music, but quite common in pop music. Here is an example from the 1970s. I don't mind you coming here, wasting all my time, because when you're standing all so near, And here's a very recent example of island phrasing. The 
Frame structures we've looked at so far could all be called regular. They involve some kind of repeated pattern of grouping and meter. However, many of the most interesting uses of phrase rhythm are those that are irregular in some way. We're going to begin with structures that are irregular, but can be seen to be derived from regular ones. This brings us to the topic of phrase expansion and overlap. Consider this song by the 19th century composer Fanny Hensel. At first, it seems to follow standard phrase rhythm, though in 2-4 time rather than 4-4 time. But something interesting happens at the end. The final two-measure group is expanded from two measures to five, and the larger four-measure group is expanded as well. Let's listen. <laughs> This kind of phrase expansion is less common in pop music, but does sometimes occur. Here's an example from Madonna, in which the second four-measure group is stretched to five measures. Now, how is that five-measure group subdivided? Given the rest in measure six, one might divide it into groups of two and three measures. But there is another possibility. Notice that the lyric line starting on the upbeat to measure five, but you make me feel, is repeated two measures later. And the harmony in measures five and six is repeated in measures seven and eight. That suggests that the expansion might arise out of repetition within the third two-measure group. Let's listen to what the phrase would sound like without that repetition. Think about whether it seems reasonable to hear Madonna's original version as an expansion of this version. Now I'd like to focus on a rather specific type of phrase expansion, and for this we need to consider the four-measure level of hypermeter. Suppose we have a regular sentence structure, 2 plus 2 plus 4, but the final four-measure group is extended just a bit to include the hyper-downbeat of the ninth measure. And let's suppose also that another phrase starts at exactly that spot. This is what we call a phrase overlap. This is difficult to achieve with a single melodic line, but it could happen with melodies or phrases in different parts of the ensemble. Listen to this passage from a Beethoven sonata for cello and piano, where the cello melody overlaps with the entrance of another melody in the piano. Before we consider why Beethoven does this, let's look at an example from popular music. The phrase structure is the same, with the second four-measure phrase extended to five measures, except that that phrase divides into two. In this case, the vocal melody of the first chorus overlaps with a new section of the song, an instrumental interlude or link that connects to the second verse. This is a rather popular strategy in both classical and pop music. To understand why it works so well, we need to think about harmony. If you look at the Beethoven passage, you can see that the end of the passage is a cadence 
a harmonic pattern of five to one. A cadence indicates the end of a phrase or section, and indeed this moment is the end of the first section of the piece, the primary theme section. In the Huey Lewis song, also, the passage ends with a 5-1 cadence, in this case marking the end of the first verse-chorus pair of the song. In both cases, the one chord of the cadence, the cadential tonic, coincides with a moment of overlap between the two large phrases. Now, it's well known in music theory that the metrical placement of a cadential tonic affects its impact. A cadential tonic that falls on a strong metrical position seems more important, more emphatic, than one that falls on a weak position. By extending the phrase to end on the hyper downbeat that starts the following phrase, these composers give the cadential tonics more structural weight, clearly indicating the end of a section. To appreciate this, let's listen to an altered version of the Huey Lewis song in which the phrase ends on the eighth downbeat rather than the ninth. You can hear that the cadential tonic does not seem so strongly emphasized, making a less satisfying section ending. Now let's consider a slightly different way of achieving the same goal. Suppose that there is a phrase overlap, as in the previous examples, but that it happens in the eighth measure of the first phrase rather than the ninth. Now this has another effect as well. The fact that the new section now begins in the eighth measure of the phrase makes that measure seem hypermetrically strong. And this creates an irregularity in the hypermeter. There are two strong measures in a row. We call this strategy a metrical reinterpretation because a measure that we expected to be metrically weak turns out to be strong. Here's an example of this strategy from a Haydn symphony. Notice that the end of the phrase features a cadence, just as in the last two examples. The overlap makes the cadential tonic strong, at least in retrospect, and thus gives it emphasis. And here's an example of metrical reinterpretation from a recent pop song. In this case, as in the Huey Lewis song, the end of the chorus overlaps with an instrumental link that starts the second verse chorus pair. The entrance of the drums clearly marks the beginning of the new section. I'm falling even more in love with you, letting go of all I've held on to. I'm standing here until you make me. We've seen two ways of using phrase overlap. In the first strategy, a four-measure phrase is extended to overlap into the fifth measure. The phrase structure is thus irregular, but regular hypermeter is maintained. In the second strategy, the four-measure phrase is not extended, but the hypermeter shifts so that its fourth measure is metrically strong. Both strategies serve the same purpose of making the end of the phrase metrically strong. Phrase overlaps also provide a sense of continuity, binding the phrases together so that the music flows smoothly from one phrase to the next. The structures we've seen so far are either regular or can be seen to be derived from regular ones, but other kinds of irregular structures cannot easily be explained in this way. One sometimes encounters melodies that are based on a repeated phrase pattern with a length other than four or eight measures, phrase lengths such as three, five, six, and seven. We're not going to look at all these possibilities. Let's just consider one case, phrase structures that are five measures in length. Any phrase that is an odd number of measures cannot be evenly divided in half, so the grouping will inevitably be irregular. Consider this theme from a Haydn string quartet. The phrase is immediately repeated. 
The fact that the second and third measures of the phrase use the same melodic pattern causes us to group them together. This further suggests treating the first three measures as one group and the fourth and fifth as a separate group. And this affects the hypermeter as well, since we tend to hear the first measure in a group as strong, leading to a 3 plus 2 hypermeter. Now consider another case, the Beatles' Eleanor Rigby. Eleanor Rigby picks up the rice in the church where a wedding has been. Lives in a dream, waits at the window. Again, the five measure phrase is immediately repeated with different lyrics. In this case, the long note in the fourth measure suggests a grouping boundary there. This makes us hear the first four measures as a group, and in turn, this suggests the 2 plus 2 hypermeter that we associate with four measure groups. The fifth measure stands alone as a one measure group. These are just two of the many ways of structuring a five measure phrase. For the interested viewer, here are some other examples in classical and popular music where irregular phrase lengths are used repeatedly. Finally, we're going to look at a type of irregular phrase that I think is particularly interesting. These are large phrases that feature a combination of end-strong and beginning-strong groups. End-strong groups pose a dilemma. While they add rhythmic spice, they are inherently unstable and less easy for us to process than beginning-strong groups. After one end-strong group, one might want to shift to a beginning-strong pattern. But making such a shift immediately would leave a long gap in the phrase. Thus, shifting out of an end-strong pattern takes some skill on the part of the composer. A related issue is the use of what I call singleton groups. A singleton group is a one-measure group at the beginning of a phrase, often just a single note or a very short melodic segment. Once you use a singleton group, what do you do next? You probably want to follow it with a longer group, perhaps a two-measure one. You could wait until the next hyper downbeat to start it, but this would, again, create a long gap. Or you could start the next group right away. This group will begin on or before a weak downbeat, and thus will be end strong. So once again, you then have the dilemma of how to get out of that end strong pattern. And notice that if you repeat the end strong group, it will eventually spill over to measure 9, which could be a problem if you want a singleton group there to start a repeat of the eight measure phrase. Let's look at some ways that composers deal with a situation where you have an end strong group early in the phrase. A simple solution with a singleton beginning is to repeat the end strong pattern three times and then have a break, allowing the repeat of the phrase to start with a singleton once again. Such a break is more satisfactory at the end of a large phrase rather than near the beginning. This is the solution adopted by Deep Blue Something in Breakfast at Tiffany's. You'll say we've got nothing in common No common ground to start from And we're falling apart You'll say. Another solution is to shift from an end strong pattern to a beginning strong one. As I explained earlier, this has to be done rather carefully. In this Beatles melody, a singleton beginning is followed by an end strong phrase in measures 2 to 3, then another one in measures 4 to 5 that extends somewhat into measure 5. There is then a very short group in measure 6 that facilitates a shift to a beginning strong pattern in measure 7 to 8, which in turn allows a repetition of the phrase to begin in the following measure. The similarity between measures 5 and 6 weakly suggests a two-measure group there that helps to ease the shift to a beginning strong pattern. Let's listen.
Now consider this Brahms melody. While the grouping is somewhat ambiguous, I hear it as being very similar to that in the Beatles melody. Once again, a singleton beginning is followed by an end strong group in measures two to three, another one in measures four to five, a one measure group in measure six, and a beginning strong group in measure seven to eight, setting up the repeat of the phrase in measure nine. A two measure group in measures five to six is also weakly suggested. You can see that the phrase structure is very similar to that of the Beatles melody shown above in gray. One difference in this case is that one could also hear the final group as overlapping into the repeat of the phrase. Let's listen. <laughs> Frida Payne's Band of Gold is similar to the last two examples, but the beginning strong pattern in measure seven and eight is repeated, creating a 10 measure phrase. Another very different solution to the dilemma of n strong groups is to repeat the two measure grouping pattern with groups beginning on even numbered measures, but allow the hypermeter to shift so that even numbered measures become strong. This may happen naturally, since we prefer a beginning strong hearing to an n strong one, but it can be reinforced by harmony, repeated patterns, and other things. This will probably mean that the phrase ends up having an odd number of measures such as seven or nine. Hypermeter is subjective, and we may not always agree on where the shift happens. In this example, I'm not sure about measures four to five, but I definitely feel that measure six is a strong measure, partly because it differs melodically from measures two and four. There has to be a shift somewhere because another phrase begins in measure eight on what is clearly a strong measure. Let's listen. In your I can still feel the way you want me when you hold me. I can still hear the words you whispered when you told me. I can stay right here forever in your arms. And there ain't no way. This theme from Mozart's clarinet quintet shows a similar strategy to the Shania Twain song, though with some differences. The grouping structure for the Twain song is shown above in gray. As in the Twain song, we have n strong groups in measures two to three and four to five, and by the time we get to measure six, that measure seems strong. And once again, the hypermetrical shift gives rise to a seven measure phrase. In this case, though, there is an empty hyper downbeat at the beginning rather than a singleton group, and the final group is extended to end on the next hyper downbeat, setting up the repetition of the phrase. Notice also the difference in higher level grouping structure between the two cases. In the Twain, the larger phrase begins on a hyper downbeat. In the Mozart, it ends on one. Another variant of the same strategy is seen in this song by the 1970s soul group, The Spinners. This is, again, quite similar to the Shania Twain song. The first group could be described as a singleton group, though it begins just after the downbeat. This is followed by a series of two measure groups, beginning on even numbered measures, that start out sounding end strong, but at some point seem to be beginning strong. Once again, I put the shift at measure six. What's different in this case is that one further two measure group is added, extending the phrase to nine measures.
Now consider this theme from the introduction to an opera aria by Handel. It starts with a single long note. You might think this is a singleton group, but actually I think it forms a three-measure group with the following two measures. From then on, the situation is very much like the spinner's song, whose grouping structure is shown above in gray. Since the first group ends on the downbeat of measure three, the natural thing is to follow it with a two-measure and strong group starting on measure four, and then two more such groups. But at some point, these groups seem to shift from end strong to beginning strong. This nicely leads into the strong measure at the beginning of the next large phrase. I'll end with what is perhaps my most complex example so far, the opening of Brahms' first string sextet. At first thought, this seems rather similar to the spinners and Handel melody shown above. A three-measure group is followed by several two-measure groups beginning on even-numbered measures. And again, we might tend to hear the hyper-downbeat shifting to even-numbered measures. But there is a difference. In this case, the phrase continues to a tenth measure followed by a repeat of the large phrase in the eleventh measure. Because the phrase is an even number of measures, this suggests we could hear a regular hypermeter throughout. And I feel this is the best hearing. Let's listen. In this video, we've seen that classical music and modern popular music are largely working with the same norms and conventions with regard to meter and grouping. We have seen also how classical composers and modern pop musicians vary and stretch these norms in interesting ways, and how they often find similar ways of doing so, whether it's in the use of end-strong patterns, phrase expansion, metrical reinterpretation, or creative mixtures of end-strong and beginning-strong patterns. I hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you come away from it with a better understanding of phrase rhythm and an appreciation for some of the deep commonalities and continuities between older classical music and modern popular music.